So that means we're supposed to continue to love one another, but stop talking. <laughs> now you can talk back to me, but but wait till I say something first. I, I, I'm supposed to remind you, and I sure don't want to forget. Look at this beautiful rose on the altar. And with great joy, we celebrate the November 13th birth of Elizabeth Rose Crumpler, daughter of Katie and Cole Crumpler. And of course, the grandparents are Donna and Earl Crumpler. And Pat Hildebrand is that very happy great great grandma. Hoorah! We are so happy for them. And so now, my friends, having shared the peace of Christ, let us enter into worship.
God's creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand.
when I was, well, I didn't really do announcements this morning. I just like said, get started. <laughs> but I, I should take some time to thank uh, and tell you all. We had Hack Shack here yesterday. We were doing in gathering for, I, I guess, the Southwest District. Our district superintendent came by and the district administrator and some members of other churches. But I, we did something called Pack Shack. Uh, and some of you have done that before, but they come and help us put together meals to give out in the food pantry. And what was it we did? Over 15,000 were packed. 15,300. Oh, 15,300. Uh, now, we shared. Uh, we had some people here from um, Calhoun County, and we sent some there. Uh, we sent some to the Arkadelphia First Church Food Pantry, El Dorado First Church Food Pantry. And we still have, I think, about 32 boxes times 34. You all do the math. Uh, really great meals to give out. I'm very grateful to Pat Shack. I'm grateful to our pastor who set that up for us. And to the many members of this church who came and helped us yesterday. So that's our announcements. <laughs> so that means we're starting over again, doesn't it, Aaron? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, first of all, I, I want to say that as I was listening to this, and thank you all for your give thanks and and uh, the hymn, I said, oh, yeah, that's right, Thanksgiving is coming up. I don't have Thanksgiving service, so just so we can dispense with that. <laughs> can y'all hear me okay? I'm not used to using this microphone. Talk a little bit. Oh, no, that means okay. I thought you meant louder. <laughs> I am not going to read the, uh, the text that's in the bulletin here. Beth had the bulletin all kind of fixed up. And I told Erin when I talked to her before she printed it, I don't have any earthly idea what we're going to talk about. So we're going to look at the Gospel of Luke. The ninth chapter, for those who like to turn in their Bibles. Uh, right near the end, we're going to read Luke chapter 9, beginning with verse 51. And of course, and I see some of you picking up two Bibles, a wonderful translation, the NRSV, so I'll read to you from a different one, from the CEB. So, Luke says, as the time approached, when Jesus was to be taken up into heaven, he determined to go to Jerusalem. If you're looking at the NRSV, I like the way it's put there even better. He set his face toward Jerusalem. What's in Jerusalem? What's waiting for him, folks? The cross, death. All right, but he set his face, or this text says, he determined to go to Jerusalem. He's got a lot on his mind, right? And he sends messengers on ahead of him. And along the way, they entered the Samaritan village to prepare for his arrival. But the Samaritan villagers refused to welcome him because he was determined to go to Jerusalem. And when the disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to consume them? But Jesus turned and spoke sternly to them, and they went on to another village. And as Jesus and his disciples traveled along the road, someone said, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, foxes have dens and birds in the skies have nests, but the human one, or the son of man, has no place to lay his head. And then Jesus said to someone else, follow me. And the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and spread the news of God's kingdom. And someone else said to Jesus, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me say goodbye to those in my house. And Jesus said, no one who puts a hand on the plow and looks back is fit for God's kingdom. This is the word of God for the people of God. <laughs> now, I, I'm going to bet that as soon as I started reading that, you said, oh, yes, that's my favorite verse. <laughs> that's, that's some strange stuff right there. And, and it makes me think, I'm going to jump over here and say that it made me think of some bumper sticker religion. And what I mean by that is, y'all have seen church signs, haven't you? That, would you call them cutesy sayings? I don't know. It's, I call it bumper sticker religion. They're not bumper stickers, but... You know, you have things like this I saw one time. Forbidden fruit creates many jams. 
It's funny, and then it makes you want to groan too, doesn't it? Or if, if you haven't heard from God lately, try sending a little knee mail. Here, this one you won't laugh about. If you think it's hot now, just wait. Really? Hey, God, what's up? <laughs> hey, God, what's up? Oh, that's cute. That one is cute. <laughs> it's bumper sticker religion. And especially when I hear things like that. If you think it's hot now, just wait. What on earth is that supposed to accomplish? I mean, I just hate it, don't you? I hate it because it's so judgmental. And it makes me think, and I've told, I know I've told my Sunday school class this. I don't know if I've told the rest of you this or not. But it makes me think of a fellow that we had in the, the little church I attended for so long. We were having an admin council meeting one night. And, and it's so seriously, he said to us, we need to buy more letters for our sign. We don't have enough letters for the sign. He said, because I came up here and I thought I was going to put up a sign and I didn't have enough letters to put it up on both sides. And so we all thought, oh, we need to buy more letters for our sign. But fortunately, one of the members said to this fellow, uh, what were you going to put up? And he, he said, what part of that shall not do you not understand? <laughs> Note to self. Don't buy any more letters as long as this fellow is a member of this church. What part of that shall not do you not understand? That's bumper sticker religion to me. I hate it. I hate it. I'm going to tell you something. At the risk of sounding a little judgmental, I hate Christians who are judgmental, don't you? <laughs> They know they can't hold, they can't answer it without being judgmental, can they? And to be honest with you, friends, I struggle with judgmentalism all the time. Yeah. I did yesterday. Aaron told me about another church that we recently helped and kind of went out of our way for. And then when she called and said, hey, would you all come and help us at this pack shack? They were too busy. And Aaron, I kind of made some snotty little remark, didn't I? I have to tell you the truth, but she's sitting right over there, you know. But I was being judgmental. I was being judgmental on the food pantry on Friday when all these people kept coming up and asking me about their gift cards. And I think, is there anybody in here that worked with me? <laughs> Nobody to tell somebody that I said I'm going to choke someone? <laughs> Because we struggle not to be judgmental. Or I do. I mean, so I'm assuming I'm just going like, to pull you into my sin there. Why are we judgmental? Christians aren't judgmental, are they? Did you hear James and John in this passage that I just read to you? What did they want to do? Does anybody remember? Hey, those Samaritans aren't being nice to you, Jesus, so let's... Bring down some fire from heaven and consume them. They want to bring down fire from heaven and kill men, women, and children. Really? James and John, what is wrong with you? What part do you not understand? And then there's this other crazy stuff going on in this, gospel, in this uh, gospel section. But before we get to it, I'm going to talk about James and John a little bit more because these guys, they should have known better. If you read, you don't even have to read the whole gospel book, you just read chapter 9 before you get to this point. What has happened? Jesus has fed the multitude. And then shortly after that, when he was away praying, they had come to him and Jesus had said, who do people say that I am? And Peter answered for all of them, but we're assuming that James and John agreed. And what did Peter tell Jesus? You are the Christ, the Messiah. So they, they've recognized he's the Messiah. And, and he's taught them, he goes on and teaches them in Luke's gospel right there about how the human one, the Son of Man, is going to suffer and die. 
And then, eight days later, Jesus goes up to the mountain with three disciples. Let's see how good we are at Sunday school religion. Who are the three that he takes to the mountaintop with him at the transfiguration? Who are they? Peter and James and John. So James and John had been there with Peter when he proclaimed Jesus as the Christ. They were there when Jesus fed the multitude. They were there when Jesus told them that the human one was going to suffer and die. And now they are among three who see Jesus transfigured in all his glory. And Luke says in his gospel that God... The voice came to them and said, this is my son. Listen to him. Wait, what did he say? Listen to him. And Jesus teaches them that if you love me and if you want to be my disciple, you must take up your cross and follow me. Listen to him, James and John. And then what do they do? You want us to call down fire from heaven? And they've been listening very well. Man, talk about being judgmental. But I'll tell you what I was going to do. I thought I'd call on one of you to come up here and explain the rest of this chapter. Because Jesus, and what does, what does this story about James and John have to do with it? Here's Jesus walking along, and one fellow says, Something like, I'm going to let here. Don't try to remember, Ellen. Flip your Bible open. He says, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow you, Lord, wherever you are going. Makes me think of a song, Patsy. You know what? I have decided to follow Jesus. Y'all know that? Yeah. And we say, no turning back. And that's what this person is saying. I'm going to follow you wherever you go. And so does Jesus say, oh, that is great, son, come on. No, he says, foxes have dens and birds of the skies have nests, but the human one has no place to lay his head. Huh? I'll get the choir to explain that to us. Huh? It, Jesus is telling him. I think when Jesus must see something, he's telling them, you know what? You're not all in. You may say I've decided to follow you, no turning back. But let me tell you how hard it's going to be. How hard is it going to be? I'm the human one, the son of man, and I don't even have a place to lay my head. So then Jesus sees another person, and he says to that person, follow me. And the guy says, Lord, let me go and bury my father. And he says, let the dead bury the dead. And then another guy says, I'm going to follow you, but let me say goodbye to those in my own house. Oh, no. Anyone who puts his hand on the plow and then turns back is not fit for the kingdom. What on earth, Jesus, are you talking about? I mean, Jesus, why would you say such harsh things to people who have professed that they're going to follow you, Jesus? What is wrong with you? Oh, y'all just caught me being judgmental, didn't you? Well, I'll just, I'll just leave that for a minute. I'll go back to that first question. What is it that is making James and John decide that they've got to bring down fury and fire from heaven on other people? And what is it that these three guys are missing? We're going to talk about that a little bit more. But you know what I think it is with James and John and with these three disciples, these would-be disciples that Jesus is so harsh with? They've got one thing in common, and now your homework is to figure out what it is. No. They've got one thing in common, and this is what it is. Control. Control. Or their desire to have control. And why do we have a desire to have control? It's because of fear. Because maybe putting it more concisely, it is our fear that we will not have control. That is what drives us. Now, I know y'all are sitting out there saying, no, I'm never afraid of anything. But there is reason to have fear, isn't there? All of us can have fear. One phone call in your life 
life changes forever. And some of you have experienced that rather recently. Turn on the news. Do you have a reason to have fear? The world seems to be spinning out of control sometimes, doesn't it? And so we have fear. We see political hatred. We see wars. We see uh, mass shootings. You can't go anywhere in this country without somebody taking a pot shot at you, can you? Can you? And so we have reason that we might feel overwhelmed by our fears. And so we need to feel like we have some control. And I think that's part of what's going on here with James and John. They're afraid and they want to have some control. And what happens when we need to feel control? What happens when we're being pushed by fear? Well, one thing we do sometimes is we get stingy. We want to hold on to the stuff that we have. Well, other people, other Christians in other churches, they get stingy, don't they? We, we're just being good students. But friends, I can't tell you how many times I myself have done this, or I have seen other Christians, or I have seen churches that when given an opportunity to give, when confronted with a need to give, they want to hold back. They want to hold on to their resources. Well, what would happen if we need to repair the roof and we spent all our money on this? Because we're afraid. We're afraid there's not going to be enough. We're afraid of scarcity. Do we have to be afraid? Do you know, a, a little earlier in Luke's gospel, Jesus said this, Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put in your lap. Get that image. It's like you're sitting there, and I guess I see grain, grain, G-R-A-I-N, what you need for, for life, to make bread or whatever. And you have a need, and he says, give, and it will be given to you. It's like you'll be sitting there, and somebody's going to put so much in your lap that it's running over. He's telling us you don't have to be afraid. This isn't a prosperity gospel. You give and you'll get something. This is Jesus saying you don't have to be afraid. God loves you enough to take care of things. God loves you enough to forgive you for every sin that you've ever done. God loves you enough that you are worthy no matter how many times you felt unworthy. God loves you enough that you don't have to be afraid. And God loves you enough that you can give of yourself. You can give generously. And you can be assured that when you give of your time, when you give of your money, when you give of your heart, when you go all in in loving your neighbor, Jesus says you're going to have a lap full that's running over because you are going to be filled with peace and joy and love and a sense of security you're going, going to have what Jesus would call abundant life we don't have to be stingy to have control but another way we seek control is what I started off talking about and that is in being judgmental and looking askance at other people that is so easy to do I know the rest of you don't do that well the people on that side, you know, I don't know. But don't we do that, though, as humans? I mean, it's so natural. It's so easy for us to put people in categories and then pass judgment on them. It's easy for us, uh, you know, to kind of try to comfort our fears by thinking that we are better than other people. By thinking, by looking at other Christians and saying, oh, those people call themselves Christians. I can't believe that a Christian would do X or Y. I can't believe that a Christian would think this or that. I can't believe so-and-so did that. And he's a pastor. Y'all have never done that, I know, but you used to have to put up with my weaknesses while I talk. 
It's so easy for us to give into our fears and be judgmental. It's so easy for us to give into our fears and blame other people for our problems. If it wasn't, if it just wasn't for those idiot Americans in that other political party than the one I'm in, things would be okay. What a bunch of idiots. Kind of like the people that drive down the highway when I'm going down with a bunch of idiots. Uh, or, you know, if it just wasn't for those illegal immigrants that are just flooding into our country, or if it wasn't for those lazy, shiftless people that are just looking for a handout, life would be better. That's what we want to do. We want to get, try to take care of our fears by being judgmental. Or we might seek control by doing what these three fellows were doing here, and that's setting our own terms for how we're going to be disciples of Jesus Christ. I mean, Jesus sees something in them the rest of us aren't seeing. But there's a reason he tells that first person, the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Because what he's saying is you're not ready to go all in. And how about the one where he tells the guy, the guy says, I'm going to follow you, but let me go bury my father first. Do you like Jesus' answer there? No. Let the dead bury their own dead. That, that doesn't sound too good, does it, Sal? No, I don't like that. <laughs> now, I've heard, I've heard a lot of explanations about that. And, and, and a lot of times, even I think, well, it wasn't this one, but the other Bible I had with a little footnote was saying, the suggestion is, Dad wasn't already dead. It's like, okay, I'm the oldest son, so I'll wait till my father dies, and I've inherited my money, and then I'll give some money to the church. Ah, yeah. I'm going to follow Jesus and get involved in caring for my neighbors after I retire, but I'm pretty busy right now. That's what's going on here, I think. And that's why Jesus says that seemingly crazy remark to him. And the same thing with the other fella that says, just says, oh, I want to go say goodbye to everyone. Jesus said, and think about it now if you're a farmer, if you're pushing a plow, you can't put your hand on the plow and then be looking back this way because what's going to happen to your rows? So he says, you can't put, if you put your hand on the plow and look backwards, you are not fit for the kingdom of heaven. What is he talking about? Apparently this person is going to put something else ahead of Jesus. What did he tell you to do if you're going to be a disciple? What do you have to give up according to Jesus? Everything. Everything. Isn't he the one that said, if you don't love me more, then you're, and if you're not willing to leave your mother, your father, your sister, your brother, your husband, your wife, and take up your cross and follow me, you are not worthy of me. So he's trying to tell us, you don't set your own terms for discipleship. I know. I know. I'm know. I'm sorry. You don't set your own terms for discipleship. You have to give everything. That's what Jesus says. And the funny thing about it is that when we do, that is an antidote. An antidote, I'll get that word out right. That is an antidote to our fear. Because you see, my friends, the antidote to our fear, to our desire for control, to our stinginess, to our judgmentalism, to our decision that we're going to set our discipleship our own way, the antidote to that has turned his face towards the cross. He is on his way. And he understands that, that, that James and John, they just don't get it. And he understands that all too often, you and I, we just don't get it. And that's why Jesus has such an urgency to go towards that cross. I think the CEB version I read to you said he determined to go to the cross. Because he knows that we need him. And he will show us with his own body 
that God loves us. No matter how greedy we are, no matter how afraid we are, no matter how controlling we are, that God loves us. He will show us with his own body that God is not going to get rid of all of our problems, but he will enter into our messiness with us. He will enter into our pain with us, and he will bring us out on the other side. God will show us. Jesus will show us with his own body that we don't have to be afraid because perfect love drives out fear. Jesus will show us with his own body on the cross that even when we fail, even when we fail to get it, even when we fail to listen, even when we resort to bumper sticker religion, even when we're greedy or judgmental or setting our own terms, even then he is willing to forgive us and to love us. Jesus will show us with his own body that the antidote to our fear and our greed and our control is trust and love. Thanks be to God who loves us beyond measure. Thanks be to a Savior who would show us with his own body that God loves you. And thanks be to a Savior who teaches us how to love other people. Thanks be to the one who, as Paul puts it, whose power at work in us is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can even ask or imagine. Thanks be to God. Amen. Okay, now what do we do? Feeding the poor, 
and that you, that you don't let up. You keep pulling us and calling us and directing us that we can have the joy of a lap that is running over with the full measure of love and peace and joy. For all these things, Holy One, we pray in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, who taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us of our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now, uh, ushers, could we take up our... Well, they're ahead of me coming up here for our time. <laughs> um, yeah, let's so just bring in these. Let us pray. Lord God, we ask that you take this gift from our hands, this gift from our hearts, and use it for the good of your holy church. Amen. <laughs>